Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jan Duplessis. I think up until now, most of you would have known me as the guy uh, giving a voice to the virtual participants. <laughs> but for this afternoon, I will be your uh, MC. And um, it, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speakers, um, three of them, in fact. Uh, it's Anwar Vahed, Werner Janssen van Rensberg, and Tuso Bukhopa. And um, if you could all please join us here on the stage. Our current speakers will each have the opportunity to speak a few words here at the podium in succession. And thereafter, we'll be taking questions. Yes, please give them a, a warm applause. Okay, then I hand over the mic to Dr. Anwar Vahed. Uh, thank you for that, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm pleased to present uh, some information about um, Teresa. So, my my presentation, I've been told to 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 not go over the 15-minute limit. I'll get bashed on the head. Um, so, I'll very briefly go through all of the slides. Uh, it's not a lot. It's just 57. Um, <laughs> Um, so I'm gonna, there are two things that the talk uh, addresses. First, what is Teresa? Um, and then secondly, uh, a few comments about uh, research data management in general um, from a data management perspective. So without any further ado, um, this is a picture of Teresa within the context of its overarching organization called NICIS. So there are two jargon terms here, DERISA, Data Intensive Research Initiative for South Africa, and NICIS, National Integrated Cyber Infrastructure System. And uh, DERISA is one pillar, the other two pillars are the networking side and the computing services side, and you'll hear more about them from my colleagues here, uh, Werner and Tuso, will um, explain, uh, give more detail about uh, the CHPC. Uh, some of you might already know that. And then Sanren, which uh, Tuso will speak about. So my focus will be on DERISA, what it is, what we do, what we provide, and what are the benefits uh, that can be had uh, from DERISA. So oh, yeah, on the left you see our objectives, and um, the main one is building what we call a research data infrastructure, national research data infrastructure. Um, and then there are other uh, objectives less, uh, of lesser priority, uh, skills and expertise development, we don't do that so much ourselves. We coordinate a lot of such events. And I'll say a little bit more about that. <clears throat> and then thirdly and fourthly, uh, we try to encourage as far as possible, especially the, the South African research community, to actually make use of DERISA services. Um, and we assist them as far as possible uh, in that. And then the last one is uh, required, requested by our main funder, which is DSI, and that is to provide what they call strategic input into various strategies and frameworks and policies and, and so on. So uh, in terms of the uh, first objective, what we've got right now is what we call uh, an active or hot storage facility, repository of about eight petabytes. And then we're in the process of develop, deploying uh, what we call a, an, a, a passive or archival uh, repository of around 20 petabytes. Um, and our main function there is to develop tools and services that the research community can use to not just manage their research data, but also to conduct 
what we call data-based research, and I'll say a bit more about that. Uh, in terms of skills and expertise development, HCD, we are coordinating what we call an e-science masters. We stayed away from the term data science for various reasons, uh, one of which is that this masters is a, a multidisciplinary masters. There's an MA and an MSc uh, for, for e-science. And then we run or sponsor or coordinate a number of um, training events across the country, one of which is the Data Science Summer School that happens at Pretoria University, and then various high school training programs, amongst others. <clears throat> uh, in terms of advocacy, we liaise with a number of organizations uh, locally and globally, and some of them are listed there. We run a research data workshop every year. This one is going to happen in July. You are cordially invited to submit. <laughs> uh, um, it's not a paper, just an abstract. Um, and then in terms of strategic input, we've developed, uh, amongst others, national big data strategy, and uh, we're involved in the development of an open science policy uh, framework. Um, this picture shows what you will see on our web, and it uh, gives a list of the most important services that we are currently providing. Of particular importance is the data deposit tool, uh, one in the middle. There's another one, uh, a data management planning tool. This is becoming more and more important. Uh, NRF and other funding agencies are more and more requiring beneficiaries of funding to actually develop a, what they call a data management planning tool. And then there are others like um, issuing a digital object identifier and a search and browse facility if you were looking for specific data. Uh, a different view of the same services. Uh, this is more focused on the process you subscribe you get 100 gigabytes free, um, and then afterwards you would log in and you would get access to various services. Uh, the main ones that I identified for this um, talk was the data deposit tool and the uh, data management planning tool. And then there are others that you don't have to log in for. It's available to the public and it's open, like a search facility and uh, what we call minting a digital object identifier. <clears throat> this is an example of the uh, interface that you'll see when um, accessing the data management planning tool. Um, I can give more detail, but for the sake of time, uh, we'll just show the picture, um, and then um, I can give more details afterwards. Now, on to a different uh, but related topic, and that is about the importance of, of, of data, uh, especially for the humanities. And I think it's fairly um, accepted that data between uh, different disciplines actually have a lot more value than just data used in a specific discipline. In fact, most of the development and innovation happens um, between the cracks of disciplines. And uh, to some extent, the university model, faculty model, and, and so on, is uh, mitigating against that, because uh, that uh, faculty model also um, supports the funding model, which is actually the reason why we are a little bit scared to share, especially resources and uh, particular assets like data. So um, with this, I would like to argue that there's no reason to do that. In fact, there's more benefit in sharing. What you see on this slide are examples of journals devoted exclusively to data publications, not uh, your traditional scholarly publications. 
and uh, you can get attribution or acknowledgement, recognition for a data publication in much the same way that you get credit for your scholarly publications. So this is something to consider um, and the argument here is please publish your data. There's a little bit of work attached to it. You need to pre-process it and make it presentable in an acceptable format. But you get recognition and you get attribution for it, uh, as I said, in the same way as for a, a, a scholarly publication. And then turning to data repositories, um, this is a statement by, made by uh, somebody at the European Union. What's happening at the moment is that the various researchers in the various disciplines, they are storing their data at repositories that have some international or global recognition. In bioinformatics, for example, there's one called Elixir. It's sitting in the, uh, somewhere in the European Union, and most bioinformatics researchers would upload or publish their data there. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, there's an issue called data sovereignty. And the question one needs to ask is, who's got control of your data? If you publish it at uh, OneDrive, Dropbox, Google Drive, and so on. Who's got control of that data? And what legal systems are applicable if anything should go wrong with your data storage? So these are some of the issues that we need to consider. And then there's also this whole misconception about uh, who, who owns the data actually that you have spent so many hours collecting with your surveys and your simulations and so on. Whose data is it? Um, and usually if you ask, my apologies to all the professors here, if, if you ask the professor who owns the data, I collected it as my data. Well, sir, no, it's not yours. <laughs> um, and so there's, there's this traditional mindset that needs to change about data. And there are a lot of misconceptions about open data, um, sharing the, 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 the goose that laid the golden egg, and your valuable assets with other people. Uh, we, we need to rethink that. And we need to realize that there's more value um, in sharing data than you know, keeping, keeping it to ourselves. Um, my last, I think, slide is about data access. I think there were some discussions and presentations about this. Um, and what we've adopted in the RISA is um, a fairly well recognized, uh, internationally recognized model called the data access spectrum. And our focus is basically on the one in the middle, group access, group based access, and the one right at the far end, uh, at the right end, uh, open access. There are other uh, uh, categories as well, but the, um, what I'm trying to encourage here today is open access. And there's no uh, conflict between open access and licensing and copyright and ownership. Um, and I think that's one issue that should probably be addressed um, separately. So this is the model, data access model that we follow. We try as much to advocate, encourage people to open their data sets. Uh, but we do understand that there might be moratoria on some data sets. Uh, we also realize not all data can be open. Uh, we don't want to openly publish a map of where the rhinos are or where the um, artillery of South Africa is stationed, so we understand and from that perspective and from a privacy and uh, 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 confidentiality perspective that some data given uh, legislation like the Poppy Act and GDPR 
that some data cannot be open. But as far as possible, um, I think most data can be. So that, thank you very much for your attention. This is my presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Anwar. Um, yes, while I wait for the slides to come up, um, we are all three from Nikis, and I think if you only remember one thing from our presentation today is to realize that this is nothing to do with national intelligence, and nothing, <laughs> it's nothing to do with crime investigation. Um, I think when you see the CI part, it's all about cyber infrastructure and what the South African government is doing to make sure that infrastructure of a cyber nature, and then we talk, we talk about compute, data, networking, how that is being made available for the nation. Um, so, so Anwar talked about the, the storage part of this, and I will talk about the computing side, and this is the, the Center for High Performance Computing. And I say an untapped opportunity for humanities and social sciences. I'm asking the question because I'm also here to learn, because traditionally our resources goes to the scientists and the engineers. So this is not traditionally the community that we engage with, and that's why it's so good, and I, I appreciate DH Ignite to, to bring us to, to this discussion. So just um, maybe quickly a background to the CHPC. So the CHPC is the Center for High Performance Computing. So if you hear CHPC, just think supercomputer. This is the national supercomputing facility for South Africa. There is only one such a facility. Um, and it is directly funded by the South African government, also the, the Department of Science and Innovation, like some of the other entities represented here. And we do that with, this with INICIS um, that, that we introduced already. All of this is administered through the CSIR. So we are a CSIR um, entity, and the CHPC based in Cape Town, but the other entities based in, in Pretoria. Now the CHPC started operations already 2007. So you can see it's going for, oh, how many years is now? 16 years um, it's been in existence. So it's got a long track record already. Um, until recently it hosted the largest HPC system in Africa. So it simply means the fastest supercomputer, not only in South Africa, but on the African continent. And the CHPC has about almost 35 employees, and we have a research technical operation divisions, and I'm leading the research side. So I'm mainly responsible for the users of, of the facility. Yeah, this is just to emphasize, we are based in, in Cape Town, so specifically for this region, if anyone is interested to come and visit us, don't hesitate. My details is on the slide, and we will be most willing to show you around. So just coming back briefly to Nikis, and this is just to, to maybe emphasize the point that this is an investment in cyber infrastructure. And, and I want to, to point out that this is a vision from the DSI that I think is being implemented very successfully. Um, making sure that when you give funding, you don't only give funding to computing services not, or only to data services. You need to give it to all three corners of the triangle. Because it doesn't help you have a big computer, but you cannot get your data there, or you cannot manage your data. And, and that's why we need the, the other units. But I will focus on only CHPC. So what is the mandate of the CHPC? It is a research enabler role. It doesn't say it is a, re a, a, a research just for a specific domain. It is research in general, so any domain area. So even though our users come from science and engineering, it doesn't mean that's the only, only users that can access the system. And we do this by provi providing a provisioning of these resources to, well, I have three bullets there, but if you combine all three of the bullets, it's almost everyone. It's the whole nation. Whether you're a South African academic research community, whether you're from, say, even African partner countries that we do support through DSI initiatives, specifically the African Square Kilometer Array countries, there's eight of them, SADC countries, they all can benefit from access to this resource. Then we talk about non-academic public sector users. I mean, these are your, well, CSIR, weather service, um, other councils, and then even private sector users can make use of it. And because this is already paid for public resource, it essentially means that academic and public use is without cost to the user. So this is something that you can access and you don't have to, to budget, say, for those compute hours that you use. For private sector, it's a, it's a cost recovery model. Now, how do we do this research enabling? Fourfold. Most simply, we give you access to compute infrastructure. If you have anything, a model to run or something that requires compute, that requires more resource than your typical laptop or desktop, 
this is a place to, to investigate. And then we go further, we support the codes and the software you want to run, so we will make it work. If it's something that is not work, you cannot get it to run or installed, we, we have the, the expertise to make it run. And then at a deeper level, we also have our research domain area support. Uh, this is more focused on, on science and engineering, and we appoint people full-time depending on what the demand from users are. And, and so we have a team to, to support. And then lastly, but very important, part of our mandate is also training and education, specifically when it comes to the use of compute resources like, like we are providing. So the infrastructure, so it's all about compute. This is the, just a picture of the, the system that we have. It's well, just a few server racks, but it is a very special system in the sense that what makes it a high-performance computing system is that all those compute racks are connected to a very fast internet in, interconnect. Um, so you can use all of these compute racks together to solve a single problem, and that is what HPC is about. And this cluster was installed a number of years ago. Actually, now it's time for refresh, and we're busy with the procurement of the, the new refresh system that probably will come by the end of this year. Uh, if you follow terminology for computing, this is a one petaflop system, which placed it around 120, between 120 and 130 on the top 500 list of supercomputers when it was installed. So you can see it is, even though it's older now, it is still a state-of-the-art facility that is used quite widely. This is one of the systems. There is a slide, um, well, just this slide. I, I just want to emphasize that when every respectable supercomputer in the world has a name, and, and South Africa's one has also got a name. It's called the CHPC Lengao Compute Cluster. And Lengao is a word that is Setswana for cheetah, and I think it's quite appropriate in the African context. And to emphasize that we're not talking about a fast computer, we are talking about the fastest computer. And this is, um, I think, embedded in this name. And if you hear the Lengao or reference to Lengao, you can, can know that this refers to, to this compute um, system. Um, this is just a few more technical details. I will leave that um, to you to have a look at. Just note that there are thousands of compute cores in this system to, to make use of. We also have what we call a graphical process unit cluster, a GPU cluster, that is appropriate for more, other, more specific applications that speed up much faster than, I'm saying, a traditional CPU cluster. And I think for this community, this is a resource that is very actively used for machine learning models, to train models, and, 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 and many users are using it. And this is, of course, domain agnostic. I mean, this is whatever domain needs to do machine learning. Um, you, if you need resources, you already have access to this. Um, so I just want to point out, it's still a modestly sized cluster, but a, a critical resource. And then, even taking it a step further, this, we are also hosting our own cloud infrastructure. So if you, can, if you think, if you're doing things, say, on, on commercial clouds, um, Nikki also has a production cloud system called Saboa. Now, it is still small in size, but effectively it provides you with resources where you can come and set up whatever you want to do. And this is giving users the flexibility to, to, to be allocated resources for cloud applications. So I give some of the specs there, so I just keep this in the back of your mind. So just to just to re repeat, so three compute infrastructures that we have in, in CHPC, the big CH, the HPC cluster, the main system, a GPU cluster, and a cloud resource. And if you are interested in any of this, you, you should talk to us. Now, just maybe just a brief background on the users and what we currently have. So over the lifetime of this Lengao compute cluster, we had about total active users, about just over 2,000 users across South Africa and many African partner countries. So you can see um, it is a resource that is quite actively being used. Um, if you look at this bar graph, over the past six years, the, the orange one refers to the number of active programs on the system. So you can see it's an increasing trend. Um, whereas the blue bars refers to how many compute hours are being used. You can see it, it flattened off and it's even reducing a bit now, which is typical. As the system becomes older, you, you have less. Some of the resources are not available anymore, but we are also impacted by load shedding quite a bit. We cannot, offer every, can, cannot keep up the whole system all the time. But it just shows that there's an increasing demand, and this does not even include now from, say, this community um, um, usage. And then, um, in terms of the, how the users are, are, are distributed, so 71% of the programs on the system is from academic users. Then the public sector, about 14%, African partner countries, about 9%, and 6% from industry. And this, to us, makes sense. I mean, most of the research being done in South Africa is at our academic institutions, so you would like to, to see a picture like this. I think what is interesting maybe to this community is if you break this down to the universities, now almost all universities in South Africa make use of this facility already. Um, of course, for scientific and 
engineering applications. But I just want to point out that if you look at this region, UCT, Stellenbosch University, UWC is already using about 34%, or 34% of the active programs are from, from this region. So if you are looking for, say, examples or other users and if that has experiences in making use of this facility, note that you will be able in your own institution already to be talking to people because all of those programs represent quite a number of different um, researchers. Um, I can get to the next slide. Okay, this is just uh, maybe to emphasize that it is a many different domains. I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, the fact that there are so many parts to this pie chart just means that this resource is not for one single domain. You will not only have your chemistry users using 90% of the system, for example. So this is just to, to show that it is truly a national facility for, for all domain areas. And then, if time allows, do I have a bit of time just on the training side? I think I basically one slide. I want to, to just mention that we are involved in dedicated training. Now, our training mandate and our focus is, is directed by what our users need. So it's not the CHPC doesn't go and develop training programs and then try to convince people to, to do it. It is what do our users tell us? Where do we observe where there's areas or gaps in skills that needs to be developed? And typically, we see that introductory coding skills is a huge um, challenge. So if you say in digital humanities that people are not necessarily doing it, I can just tell you that even in the science and engineering disciplines, there are, there's a huge skills gap still that we need to address. So we do have what we call our introductory programming school where it's very much focused on Python and, and Linux training um, for, for our users. And we ended our summer school um, in February. Um, we, we involved some of the individuals that are already here. We, where we had a huge hybrid um, training program where we had online material that we as CHPC presented, but together with this physical hosted sites at, at almost every university where students could come and at a physical venue sit and collaborate with their colleagues and tutors to, to do the training. This is a big experiment for us. Um, in the end, it reached about 500 students in this um, training event. And again, this is open to the universities, it's not only for, for CHPC users. I mean, if there's people at the universities that, that need this, you can do, you can participate. And um, we, will, we do it every year, um, end of January, beginning of February. But we also have other training events like Winter School in Parallel Programming, where it comes a bit more to the nitty gritty of what it means to run codes effectively on a, on a distributed computing system like ours, so that is more specific. And then a number of other projects that I don't have time to, to go into, but um, I'm willing to talk to you. So um, please just note that it's part of our mandate to, to do development and, and training as well. And I think that is it. This is my last slide. It's just a slide on practical access. If you, if you want to read more on this, um, there are some sites there. The most important one is the one in red, where it's just users.chpc.ac.za. It tells you what is required if you want to register to use um, the, the, the models that we use. Um, we do have models where you have to register as a principal investigator, you register a research program, you get an allocation of compute hours, and you can add your, your members of your research teams to, to make use of this. So this is just very practical, but of course, I'm, I'm also willing to discuss and. Yeah, we are all going to be here, I'm at least for the rest of the day. If anybody wants to talk about some of these um, aspects that I mentioned, I would be more than, than willing. So thank you very much. Thank you, Verna. I see you and I um, got the memo coincidentally with the shirts. <laughs> uh, can I have the slide, please? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tuso. Uh, I'm the services um, development engineer at Sunren. So I'm just here to talk about Sunren and what we do. Uh, also, how, how we support uh, your research initiatives So the Sunren, uh, where we fit into the NICIS unit. So the NICIS unit is actually a, a unit in the CSIR, which has like three areas, which is our Sunren, responsible for the network services, the CHPC, 
for high performance computing and DERISA. So, uh, as SANREN, we form part of uh, what is known as the SANREN. So, the SANREN consists of us, SANREN, and TNET. So, TNET is an NPO that is responsible for the operations of our network and also hosting the production services of our network. And us as SANREN, we are responsible for designing and building the network and also prototyping the services that we we have on our, on, on our network. So basically an NREN is actually a, a country's re network infrastructure that is responsible for the research and education uh, initiatives of the country. So uh, we uh, together, SANREN and together is with TNET from uh, the South African NREN. So there are multiple NREN across the world as it is currently. So just a little background on TNET. It was founded in the year 2000. Uh, they, they've acquired uh, their, they became fully licensed uh, as a network service provider in the year 2008. And they've acquired uh, multiple uh, links across the, the country and internationally as well at the discounted pricing. And going forward, the Sunrain, it was funded in the year 2005. It is funded by, by the DSI uh, with a mandate to provide uh, network infrastructure to the research and education community. So this is a visual depiction of our, our network. So we are having uh, multiple 100 gigabits per second uh, links and 10 gigabits per second uh, links onto our across the country and also internationally. So this is just basically uh, more information relating to our network and our users. So we host about 1.2 million uh, users and we've connected about uh, over 300 sites. So that's our research and education institutions. And also uh, we have about two, two 250 gigabits uh, per second internet bandwidth uh, internationally. And we uh, have multiple 100 gigabits per second backbone links between all the, the majors in Metro. That being Johannesburg, your Cape Town, and Devon, and also Pretoria as well. So uh, at Sandrin, we, uh, on top of our network infrastructure, we have uh, value-added services that we also offer to the research and, and education community. So uh, you might be familiar with Edge Roam. Uh, the other one is Large Data Transfer, File Sender, and Sapphire. So I'll speak to Edge Roam. So Edge Roam is the wireless service uh, network that we offer to the research and education uh, institution. You might have connected to to eat in your respective institution. So that's what we offer. And we also offer your large data transfer needs. So we have uh, different uh, data transfer nodes across, across our, our network, which uses Clobus uh, as a tool to transfer data between, between the, the transfer nodes that you can be able to use as, a, as our beneficiaries. So typically, uh, if you have uh, data transfer needs, you want to transfer over 100 gig of uh, files or whatever for your research, you can, you can make, use our, make use of our data transfer nodes. Uh, we, are ex we are reachable on, the, on that uh, email address, pet at sunren.ac.za. So for your less than 100 gig of uh, data transfer needs, you can use our file sender, which is a, a web application that you can be able to use using your organizational account. So it's integrated with the Sapphire. So with Sapphire, you are able to use your organizational, organizational account to make use of the, of the web, web application to send your 
files to your respective uh, people that you'll be working on within your, with your research. And we are also reachable on the email address sysadmin at sunren.ac.za for support queries. And we also have Sapphire. So Sapphire is an academic uh, identity federation. So you are able to use Sapphire integrated with your application so that you can be able to, in, to it's, it's basically to encourage uh, research collaborations because you are able to access uh, resources from a specific institution using your institutional account details. So it will be important to make use of that for research purposes, whether you are uh, developing an application within your uh, respective institution, you can integrate it with Sapphire for single sign-on solution to, to work with, with other institutions. So the people that are responsible for Sapphire is uh, TNET. So you can liaise with Guy, Guy Halls from TNET to help you with that. And the other services are, that we offer is PED, that's Performance Enhancement response, response, response Team, which is responsible for supporting you to be able to, if you are having uh, issues with, uh, let's say, uh, data transfer, maybe your network is slow, or there's some bottlenecks that are happening within the network, we can, you can reach us and we are able to help and see what solution fits best for you to, to get across. So Persona is just our, it's, our, it's a tool that we use for, for monitoring the network and looking at the bottlenecks in, in order to, to improve the network. The other service that we have is the CSET. So that's to do with your, okay, thank you, I see. So that's to do with your cyber security, anything, mm, related to cyber security, your vulnerability assessments. We are able to do that for you. Adversary services, when it comes to cyber security, we can do that for you. And the other one is NetSage. So that's basically a, a collection of net, NetFlow data that we can offer to students or researchers uh, for their research purposes. So yeah, that's what we can do for you as Sunren. I thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, excuse me, I think that's me. Um, as a study law, we try to get away from the idea that we only do languages, but since I didn't introduce this theme, I'm going to say something I wasn't going to. Um, dirisa means to use in Setswana, so um, I hope that you all feel that that you can use these people in a good way, and not abuse, and that, that their presentations have been useful, and we'll now be taking questions for the speakers. Okay. If your questions are for individual speakers, please just, just give an indication of that. Okay. I, uh, sorry, uh, just from an online participant, non Tobacco, uh, saying and asking thanks for the presentation, Nikki, on Nikki's and Derisa. Are your research data science classes offered virtually or is it only in person? Pardon, uh, we've just lost a mic. So. Uh, <laughs> We, we've discovered it. Um, I don't know if any one of you wants to answer that specifically. Uh, is it uh, the RISA specific? Was that the question? The training that we are offering? Um, well, I'll answer anyway. <laughs> um, so, most of our courses, because of COVID, have been online, but we are now definitely going hybrid. Uh, with most of the training and um, speaking of uh, training especially for uh, entry into the uh, data intensive science world 
we do uh, offer courses like introduction to Python, uh, introduction to Linux, I think Werner mentioned that, and we can certainly um, adapt and modify, refine the courses to suit your needs. Also, I think a point that Werner made. Uh, so if you have specific needs, uh, there's a lot of discussion about this earlier, about courses and training and how much you should be trained and whether training should be done, can you do without it? And I think one of the answers were, yeah, you can, okay. So you can also have an ox wagon uh, and go to work with that uh, as, as well. So, um, yeah, uh, I hope I've answered. We are going face to face. We now hybrid. All right, then um, I see Menu has his hand up. And I've got a mic as well, so that's good. Thanks. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I think for, for some of the people in the room, it might be very technical, uh, but there are probably also people here who find this, like me, who find this actually very exciting. <laughs> um, one of the things I really like is the idea of this data storage. I mean, we're kind of struggling at some point with the amount of data, but that seems to be covered. Um, what, I, what I was wondering if you, uh, because you said, I mean, it's nice to share your data so people can actually reuse it, et cetera. Um, there's now also a trend where people share their code of the analyses, for example, so people can re-see what kind of analysis you've done, and perhaps that you've made a mistake and it can then be, be covered, so it's really just out there in the open. Do you also have support for, for sharing code, or is it just for the data itself? The short answer is yes. Um, we can uh, support code as well. Uh, I didn't want to go into this level of detail, but it's, it's, for us, it's not about data. It's about what uh, is called digital objects. And it's a technical term, and it can be anything that you can represent on a computer, including software and um, other abstractions. Of, there was a lot of discussion about, I think, abstractions earlier on. Uh, all of us can be abstracted digitally. I think uh, Mark Zuckerberg call, calls that the metaverse, a kind of a virtual universe where all of us and everything in this world is represented virtually. So all of those things we think of as digital objects and we've got a facility to store all of that. All right, I see a question there. Uh, thank you all for your presentations. A lot of information, uh, very much technical to me, except for Eddie Rowe, because we use that at Stellenbosch University. And of course, your data repository, because this is where we post all our postgraduate, you know, masters and PhD dissertations. So my question, I mean, any of you can answer that. Uh, do you, how do you work directly with researchers? And in this case will be, you know, your social scientists, or do you work directly with specific divisions uh, within universities? Because for me, it's the first time I'm hearing about this division and what you're actually offering. Well, I, maybe I can just take a first step and answer part of this. Um, we, we engage with researchers that need the resource. And, and so we don't upfront decide, no, well, we're only going to work with this particular set of researchers or, or a specific group. Um, but of course, it's a, it's a bit of a catch-22. I mean, if you, if you don't know about this, then, then you will not take it up. And I think that is why we have, I mean, opportunities like this to, to share, um, because we want researchers or people that can make use of any of this infrastructure to recognize at least what is out there. And if you do take the step to, and you to recognize that something you can actually productively use, the chance is very good that you will be able to use it because the resource is there. It's not like there's excluding, excluding users by default. It is a national facility that is there for, for everybody. So I know answering a bit generic, but I, I'm, I hope it, it does answer. Um, in, in terms of if we just look at the computing side, which I represent, um, we, we, we typically provide that resource for somebody that needs more compute power than they can typically get from their, their laptop. So the ideal user for us is somebody that 
get, is it reached a point where they are frustrated. They have to wait too long for their models to simulate and, 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 and so on. And then they come and knock at our door and they say, well, and then we get them registered in our system and they can suddenly do it much more efficiently. That's the kind of user. But I mean, we have many different type, classes of users. Some people don't have resources and they do everything at, at CHPC. They don't have, say, institutionally resources. So yeah, um, I hope that answers the question. I don't know if anybody else wants to answer. Thank you. Um, I sort of want to ask a bit of a follow-up, mainly to you, Vernon, because I have attempted to use the CHPC in the past, admittedly quite a long time ago, about a decade ago, and I gave up. Uh, and since then, I've been using public clouds for a lot of my research. And, and the reason for that was that it was, at that time, very difficult to get access to resources of the CHPC. So perhaps you can talk to the general availability uh, you know, if we were to go in now and apply for access, uh, how likely we were to, to get time at the CHPC. Thanks. Yes, I know exactly what you are talking about. Um, I think I mentioned the, the current compute cluster is, was installed in 2016, the first phase. So if you talk about more than a decade ago, you worked on systems before that. And admittedly, the resources at CHPC was very limited at that stage. So there were definitely frustrated users. But when we put down this new system in 2016, it increased the capacity of CHPC 18 times, so one eight. So suddenly we had a resource that is significantly, well, bigger than we had. And over the years, yes, it reached capacity, but it never reaches that kind of capacity where it is multiple times oversubscribed. So what we've seen is, yes, it, re it will hit 100%, and sometimes it will hit 100% capacity for some time, but there, the chance that you wait significant time periods for your jobs to start is slim, because we do manage it quite, we quite um, closely how much resource is allocated to each user. And simply because there is such a lot of use, um, resource, I mean, we talk about, maybe I don't want to maybe mention things that others don't follow, but for you will understand that we've got more than 1,300 nodes on that system, and we can allocate a certain number of, of, of CPU cores to a user based on how the queuing system is set up. So all I can say is the general answer is that capacity constraints is not our biggest concern uh, over the recent years. It was actually, actually things that started to happen is, is more on a data side, storage side. Users were, were coming to us and say, well, we need, we need more storage to put our data to actually do our compute. And this is why the RISA is so, well, welcome to, I mean, this is why the RISA is so important to offer those, those, research, those, those resources. But yeah, if you, if you worked at the CHPC 10 years ago, you cannot compare it to what it is today. Um, that is the simple answer. Yeah, there's also the, the OpenStack cloud that can now be used for services as well. <coughs> All right, then I think we might have time for one more question. Okay, no, uh, sorry. <laughs> Please continue it during the tea break. Thank you, gentlemen. We, I think that was a very useful presentation.